about to do a podcast. The, the Loudwire, Loudwire podcast. podcast. And he's Joe. And he's Graham. And today, our guest, Matt Hafey from Trivium. We're going to be talking about all different kinds of stuff with him. The newest Trivium record, Silence in the Snow. His Metallica fanship. Huge Metallica fan. Yeah. Uh, and the process of getting his voice back, if you might remember... Uh, he blew out his voice a while ago. In 2014. Yeah, and he's been doing a lot better. Uh, we're going to talk to him about that. And for this edition of Rocker vs. Writer, we're going to be talking Talica. What is the best Metallica album? Matt Hafey taking Master of Puppets. Joe, you will be taking... Ride the Lightning, yeah. All right, a fine choice. It's the Loudwire Podcast. Sit down. And shout! <laughs> All right, Loudwire Podcast, everyone, and we've got Mr. Matt Hafey from Trivium in the studio. Thank you so much for coming, man. No problem. Appreciate Matt Cleachy your... Hafey. Yes, Cleachy <laughs> Hafey. We, we can fix that one on Wikipedia. There's only been a couple of times where they've gotten the names wrong. I, I think one of them is Lita Ford, and then I, they said that her name was like Lita Rosetta Ford or something like that, but huh. that was just not correct. Hmm. So there's been a lot <laughs> right. of times, and she's just like, no... So it's fun when they get the names wrong. Just yeah, that was awesome. Right off. Oh, thank yeah, you. I, I'm glad too. you enjoyed it. You were a great guest. Thanks. Uh, check that out on our YouTube channel. Yeah. It's probably up I was already. hoping for more screwed up stuff. Maybe next time. I know. Well, well you were saying that it said that you were dead yeah, at one point, Yeah, I saw right? that recently. At least a year ago, it said on there that I that I they had like my birth year and like my death date. That death date. <laughs> what my was God. it? I don't, I don't remember. remember. I don't uh, remember. Not uh, like long. June 6th or anything? No, what's that? 6-6. Six, six. Oh, okay. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> so your last album that came out was Silence in the Snow. And it was the first Trivium album that actually exclusively featured clean singing. Now, you blew out your voice at Rock in the Range in 2014. Is that why there was only clean singing on this album? Or was this a direction that you wanted to go into anyway? And it's cool you said that because the Crusade is like 99% singing. There's like 1% of screaming. I think there's like a background like Go or something on one of the other songs. Or maybe there's something in Dragon. Um, this one, we said if Silence needed screaming, we would do it. And when we finished all the clean vocals, we said it doesn't need it. Like we checked it out, it didn't need it, we didn't didn't put it in. Um initially when I first blew my voice out after Rock on the Range, I was not able to sing or scream. So I started training with a new vocal teacher mm -hmm. that Matt from Avenged actually recommended to me, which is his teacher, Ron Anderson. And within the last like eight, ten months or so, I've been able to scream again. It's a com completely new technique that sounds the same. And thankfully, I can scream all the old stuff all over again, where before I wasn't able to immediately when Silence of the Snow came out. But I said, if this thing needs screaming, I'd do the old technique just to do it because we weren't on tour. Mm -hmm. Didn't need it, so didn't put it on. Now, with the new screaming technique, so before you were using the old one, I mean, I'm imagining you were in quite like a bit of pain oh, um, yeah. after all shows. The time. All the time. Now, did you just kind of think that this is what it's going to be? There's no way around this, so you're just going to have to deal with it? Exactly. And I thought it was normal, and I thought due to the fact that I was able to do full tours that it was right. And I'd show it to like ENTs or other screaming people and mm -hmm. like, oh yeah, if, if you're able to do this every night, you're fine. But it would always hurt. And I always think it's something else. Is it reflux? Is it this? Is it that? Is it allergies? And when I started, when this new technique finally started kicking in and working and it keeps getting better, like every month that I'm working at, it gets better and better. It's actually easier to do that than it is to speak. Like I feel more vocal wear right now talking than I do doing the screaming technique, which is crazy. Because like my old screaming technique was right here. Mm -hmm. My vocal cords flapping against each other and jamming and feeling terrible. And this new one, what's weird is the screaming actually resonates from your nasal cavity. But there's no way I could like mimic that right now. It seems to only, I can only really channel it right before playing a show now. Interesting. Or be like towards the tail end of rehearsing. Like I sing like seven days a week, usually like one to three, four hours a day. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. And it's usually wow. around the midway yeah. point that the screaming is really good. Yeah, like proper singing is supposed to like vibrate the roof of your mouth and like your sinuses and stuff like yeah, it's, that. It's, like, there's, yeah, there's not supposed to be any pull here. Yeah, because that's what I used to be in a death metal band in high school. And that, I had the same thing after yep. band practice. I was just like, I could yep. hardly talk. My voice was hoarse, but whatever, like it's fun. Yeah. And then <laughs> you figure out the right way to do it. And like like you said, it it does come very naturally. Like mm -hmm. it sounds weird that you could do it just as easily as yes, speaking, but once you nail the technique, it is kind of surprising how you're mm -hmm. like, I can just yeah. And the hard thing that, that kids have with it, because what I've been doing is I've been posting um, practices of like just myself singing, screaming, mm -hmm. guitar playing. And 
it's with nothing. And people are so used to hearing screaming on records. And when people hear screaming on records, it's through compressors, equalizers, mm. delays, reverbs, probably double to quadruple tracking when they think it's one voice, one person. It's really not. Mm -hmm. So I've just been recording it directly in the room that I'm in off my phone. And they're like, why is that so quiet? And what I <laughs> tell people is, like with an electric guitar, I wouldn't be able to play that at a festival without an amp. So mm -hmm. you're using this as the amplification, you're using the microphone to deliver your voice yeah. to a big thing. And it shouldn't be loud and it shouldn't be painful. And I'm sure there are maybe a couple singers that don't need to warm up, don't have technique, just do whatever. And their screaming sounds incredible and they do it every single night. But it's pretty rare that that happens, that it sounds amazing from the beginning of the tour to the end. The other day we rehearsed for, I don't know, a while. I, I sang like, I sang and screamed for six hours and it was an absolute piece of cake. And the next day I did it again for six hours. And the next day I did it for two hours and been singing every single day since then with no wear so it just shows that with proper technique it makes you not have to worry about things now are you also posting these kind of as awareness for fans is like you know you see a lot of vocal covers on youtube and then just kids being in bands and thinking that all you really need to do is just show up and scream and it, it is not that <laughs> yeah, easy really not um so is this kind of like an awareness for your fans too to try to teach them the right way to do this yeah i, I was put on there too that there are no effects here. You guys, and I say that people are used to hearing screaming live with a PA or screaming on a record, and that's not really the way it sounds. Um, some great screamers I've talked to, they're like, oh, yeah, I've heard my screaming right now. You laugh because it's so quiet. But when you hear it live, it looks like their veins are popping out, their faces like strained. Yeah. But it's quiet, and it sounds great. It doesn't matter at, like the volume because the volume you're going to be getting at is going to be through a PA through a record anyway. It's the tone. Yeah, and it's all about making it real. And I and I keep I always push that bands need to be rehearsing all the time. And we have seven records out and I've been in the band since I was twelve and I still practice seven days a week, both guitar and vocals separately. And I think that's incredibly important. Because I meet a lot of young bands now that are doing decently that dudes that can't play their own music live. They don't warm up. They don't care to practice. I've I've talked to some bands I'm like, Hey, I, I know you liked our band a bit. I can give you some lessons, I can get you shredding. They just didn't show up. <laughs> so, oh, how do you not show lame. up to that? <laughs> yeah, because it's just some people just don't have the drive. And I figure if we're going to be in bands, the least that we should be able to do is play our instruments well and be able to play the songs that we do on record live. Mm -hmm. yeah. Unless you're like Venom in 1980 or something like that, <laughs> then it's encouraged to be sloppy. Yeah. Oh, totally. And, you know, it must be so refreshing to be able to get back and to scream again, because I imagine that being on stage in front of so many people uh, for a while now without... You know, having screamed for such a long time, being in front of that people, I'm sure a part of you just like, oh, I just want to scream yeah, my missed, head off I really at these missed people. It. Like it was, a visceral reaction. Mm -hmm. I missed it. And what we would have, we would have Corey do it because I just wasn't yeah. there yet. Um, but yeah, it's been amazing. We've been playing all old Ascendancy stuff, old Ember to Inferno stuff. And I'm screaming it all. We're doing Shattering the Skies Above. This is a pretty heavy song off uh, the God of War 3 soundtrack. Oh, yeah, yeah. And I know that so one. It's so fun to be able to do that stuff. And it sounds huge and brutal and tougher than it used to. But if you heard it off stage, you'd be like, oh, that's not as loud as I would have thought. Yeah. But it course. sounds huge live, which is all that matters. Because like I said, an unplugged in, unmiked guitar is going to be pretty damn quiet. Yeah, of, co of course. So, I mean, when you did go to uh, Silence in the Snow and you took a, a softer direction than in past with Trivium, uh, I was wondering, did you revert back to some of your very old influences? Like back when you were a kid, like the Blink-182s <laughs> and the Real Big Fish, like in any sort of way, did was there... A, a renewed inspiration there from anything from your childhood. I went back to the roots, but different roots. I went to the roots of where our favorite bands came from. I looked at like who is collectively in flames is, but also Metallica's sure. And everything in between and metalcore bands, who would it all stem from? And that stemmed from Iron Maiden, Judas Priest, Black Sabbath, Ozzy Osbourne, yeah. Dio, Rainbow. And those were the things we listened to the most. So when I was younger and I started getting into metal, my goal was always to be a singer like Ronnie James Dio, like Bruce Dickinson, like Freddie Mercury, knowing I would never be as good as any of them. But that's still something that I have in my head that I want to be as good as them. I know I'll never be as good as them, but I'll work as hard as I can to get that good. That's that's the top. It doesn't get any better than exactly. those guys. So that's more so the world of singing that I was putting into silence, like more like those classic guys. Yeah, for sure. So just straight ahead, heavy metal, mm -hmm. flush with all these huge sweeping hooks, everything exactly, like that. Exactly, exactly. And I, as I've been learning more about my voice over these years since the injury and having completely rebuilt it and practicing all the time, I will see, you know, I, I loved 
really ra- I love really raspy singers. That's something that I don't think I can physically learn and don't think I can physically do because I've been trying to do it since Ember to Inferno, since before that, since I was like 13 years old, I've been trying that. And I've had it, you know, people have mentioned that I've had it on Shogun, I've had it on Crusade, but I was ripping my voice apart. The same way I was with the screaming, I was just gruffing it from here. And I think it makes it a little different. I think that I've been coming more into realizing my identity has been what it always has been. Extremely powerful, loud, clean singing and screaming. And it's like black and white. And those are the two things I feel like I'm capable of. Sure, yeah, you have the duality in the music. Yeah, and yeah. the one in the middle is the hardest one for me. But there are so many raspy singers in the world that don't do the other sides. So it's kind of like I do black and white, not gray. Well, I mean, like, <laughs> Head- Headfield's blown his voice out before, too. So, I mean, you know, one of the raspiest singers. And, of course, we just got uh, some new Metallica material coming in. I know you're a huge Metallica fan. Fans, uh, I think, are going pretty nuts for it, to be honest. Like, they're, you know, they're the critics out there and everything. But I think fans generally are just happy to see that it's back to, like, pure thrash. Mm-hmm. Exactly. So, like I mean, we were just talking about, like, going back to the roots with everything, mm-hmm. too. Yeah, exactly. I mean, what what are you thinking? Are you, is, it, is Hardwired pumping you up for the yeah, record? Yeah, I was so stoked to see it. And what, what really kicked it off for me was seeing the footage from the Minneapolis show they just played. Yeah, yeah. And seeing how freaking gigantic that show was. And how big Metallica still is. I mean, bigger than they've ever been. And it gives me faith in music, gives me faith in metal. It keeps the door open for bands like us. You know, the fact that Metallica can do 60,000 people in Minneapolis, that's a good sign. It's mm-hmm. better better them than some pop band. Very no, true. Definitely. Yeah. I mean, uh, it, it's an interesting thing that when you started out, uh, it I always forget how young you still are because you've been around yeah. for so long. And at like 20 years old, you were opening for Metallica and Iron Maiden and Korn and doing all these amazing things that are, is just, it just doesn't happen to young people all that much. Mm-hmm. So like, what can you say to how that affects you as a person? And like, does that inflate your ego? Does that make you feel bulletproof? Like what, what did that do to you? I mean, there were minutes, you know, when 18, 19, 20, when we were on like, magazine covers and magazines are posting Trivium, the next Metallica. Yeah. And then we're saying, saying truthfully what the childhood goal was. I mean, my goal when I was a kid was to be an arena metal band. Yeah. And that still is my goal. But when you hear it from an 18 year old, when other bands hear it from 18 year olds, it freaks them out. And they're like, who are these cocky bastards? Yeah. But it's, you know what? I would rather see new bands coming out with confidence like that than not know, than having ambiguous goals, you know? Cause like I, we're definitely not the kind of band that's like, oh, well, whatever happens, happens. We're cool with that. Mm-hmm. We're the kind of band that wants to be doing what Iron Maiden's doing. We want to have our own, I want our own plane with it. With our freaking <laughs> skull on it. And I want to be playing in front of, you know, 20 to 100,000 people a show. Of course. That's, that's the legacy I've always wanted since I was 12 years old. And we're still working to get that. We're not there. Um, hopefully we're on the path. If it all ends, I mean, to look at it positively, at least I was, we were all able to put everything we are and everything we've ever wanted to be into something. And genuinely work towards that correctly. Um, but what's funny when you mentioned the 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 age thing, it is funny. When we first came out, everyone was like, "Who's this young band of kids?" Yeah. And now I remember hearing about a radio station that one of our label guys was trying to get them to play us, and they're like, "They said he said, man, aren't those guys a bunch of like fifty or sixty year olds in the seventies? <laughs> like, what the hell happened? Uh, all of a sudden, we were too young to play in all these things, like too young to play on other bands, Jaeger endorsed tours. Oh, and that's now right. Sudden, yeah, yeah. Now all of a sudden, we're too old to be played on radio stations. But he told him he was like, they're thirty. And I'm like, oh, I thought they were fifty, sixty. And yeah. it blows my mind. A lot 60. of oh, yeah, a Bruce lot. Dickinson's of, not even sixty. Yeah. <laughs> and a lot of younger bands that are out now. People are talking about all oh, these younger bands. We're the same age as them. Yeah, I think people don't realize it, which maybe maybe it's a compliment to us. Maybe it's a slight. I can't tell yet. Maybe it's a compliment in the fact they think we've been around forever because we built a legacy. Yeah. But yeah, we're the same age as a lot of the young, quote, young bands, which is pretty weird. It it is very weird. Like, I mean, I can't imagine at 20 years old standing in front of like a, a festival, hundreds, thousands of people. And right before Iron Maiden's about to go on. Yeah, like, and we got to do it again just two months ago. We played Grass Pop, 80,000 people. We played right before Maiden. It was us and then Maiden on main stage B, main stage A. Wow. And Did you was, Do you feel like you're, it was like the same amount of being humble and thankful to be there? Absolutely. And oh, wow. I think now we're, we have better heads on us than we ever have. Not saying we're ever bad people. Yeah. Probably 18, 19, 20, 21, we were, when things started going good, maybe there was a little bit of, cockiness but what was good that happened to us is our band 
exploded for a minute on Ascendancy in the UK and released the Crusade. The UK hated the Crusade and it went downwards. Mm. The same magazines that put us on the cover said we're the best band in the world were the same magazine that put us on the cover and said we're the worst band in the world. Which I don't know why they put us on the cover to say that. But we had to build it back up. So it was good for us that starting at 12 in this band, we've had so many ups and downs and weird good things and weird terrible things and everything in between that's ever happened to us that it's built us to what we are now. And nowadays... We're confident in what we are, and I feel like we're more so now tripping than we've ever have been. Let's get into Rocker versus Writer. Today, with Matt Heafy, we're going to be debating the greatest Metallica album, something you've all probably debated with your friends a million times. We're going to do it with Matt. Matt, you will be taking... Which Metallica album? Master of Puppets. Master of Puppets, oh. the classic. And uh, I'm going to be taking Ride the Lightning. Also awesome. a great choice. Uh, Matt, an opening statement maybe on Master of Puppets. What is it about that record that just uh, not only is maybe the epitome of Metallica, but is perhaps your personal favorite also? Well, to preface that, when you're talking about Rocker versus Writer, I actually used to write for this magazine in Florida called Central Florida Inner Source. Okay, and so when, you're a writer too. And when yeah. Headbangers Ball came through, I interviewed every band. The only the only band I didn't I didn't have the chance to interview that day was Lamb of God, but I interviewed every other band for oh, the wow. magazine. And I used to like review bands, like I reviewed the Nagel Far CD, the Shield Love record. That band. Yeah, oh, yeah, that's so that's good. probably my favorite. Love that Far. Band. I've always referred that record as being if. Dissection of Storm of the Lights Bane is like the coldest black metal album due to the cover Ooh, and everything. Mm-hmm. Shield's like one of the hottest ones for me. I'm Feels glad like, you used the word cold yeah, there. Yeah. 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 But yeah, so back to Metallica Master of Puppets. Um I would say it's the best Metallica record because it encapsulates past, present, and future of what Metallica is. I guess present's a difficult thing to say, but present they still play this stuff live. Yeah. Past, it shows what their roots were with the more primal stuff. It doesn't really go so much as what the Kill 'Em All style was, but there definitely is no, a lot of but... like Ride the Lightning within Master Puppets mm-hmm. in a way. But it also has moments of what you'd see happen later on, like the Black Album with things like Sanitarium, that they can go from that very quiet to very loud, very soft, very hard, and juxtapose those two things together in a really good balance. And to, although I love Ride the Lightning, what I would do to take away from Ride the Lightning in comparison to Master Puppets is that was even more like the primal thrash direction. So if they kept going and Ride of Lightning, I feel like they would have been just a pure thrash band. Mm. Not, not calling that record just a pure thrash record, because it, it does have variety on it. But I think with Master, they started showing more progressive roots, started showing different things that they were going to be doing later in the future. Hmm. All right, you present a tough argument, sir. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm going to go with Ride the Lightning because, I mean, like you point out, like it is more of a primal thrash record. And for me, when I listen to thrash, that's what I want. I want that deep primal awakening of disturbing something at your core that maybe you didn't even realize was there. And, I mean, you see the reaction in thrash pits. Like, there's no pit like a thrash pit. And that's mm-hmm. that's a very natural reaction to that music. And Ride the Lightning brings that in spades like no other Metallica album. It is just furious, mostly the whole way through. I mean, you've got Fade to Black, but it's cool because you've got those nice whimsical elements. So it's a little bit of a breath of fresh air. It takes you out of that moment for a second, because if you have just straight ahead pummeling thrash for 40, 50 minutes, your attention can start to wander a little bit. Mm -hmm. But you hear those guitars, Mm -hmm. you go, oh. And then they go right back into it, and it's just like they just set you up just to kick you right in the balls again. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's for sure. Not that I'm really saying that, you know, Ride the Lightning's the best because you just felt like you got kicked in the nuts because that's not <laughs> yeah. a good feeling. But those, I mean, those two are definitely, I think, the pinnacle of the top. Like, if there were just a couple Metallica records you could pick up the entire thing, like those two would be in like the top three or top four, mm-hmm. I think. And I, for me, I would even say it's like, so let's say Master and Ride, I would, I would put Black Album up there. And I know some people are like, well, why not Justice up there? But I, I'd almost put Black Album before Justice for that. But, yeah, those two are so good. I mean, it's it's really hard to say. (laughs) And what's so great about Master is that I feel like they were able to have catchy hooks, not in the way like an Iron Maiden hook would be, but they started showing like what a Metallica hook could be. And Mm. something that it's not this... I'm sorry, it's happening. The <laughs> no, don't it's worry not about this it. diverse flowing line of different notes and words and stuff, but it's something that's catchy and to the point, you know, like the Master Puppets chorus itself. And I think that's 
that's an art to be able to have catchiness in simplicity in thrash in heavy music because like you did say with that chorus the the riff on that is pretty vocal Mm -hmm. right before james says obey your master like Mm -hmm. you can't have that line without that riff Mm -hmm. so it is kind of like they're expanding and playing around Mm-hmm. But like I said, I like the straight ahead, <laughs> kick you in the balls. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I think because I'm, my, my brain is so ADD, that's why I like Master so much. Because it jumps around to yeah, a bunch of different stuff. it has stuff. so many different things that can happen. And I think the riff writing on Ride the Lightning is probably James' strongest. I mean, I'm not going to say the riffs to Master of Puppets and Battery are terrible. Yeah, so yeah. Not, so not that's not what I'm saying, Master. everyone. <laughs> Um, But there's just some sort of reckless energy on there, and there's still slight traces of the huge new wave of British heavy metal influence. Mm -hmm. So you still have a little bit of the roots there. So, like, Kill 'em All is great because it's a little bit of, you know, the roots of new wave of British heavy metal and this new thing that they pretty much invented. Like, Kill 'em All is the first thrash album. Mm -hmm. So you have, anytime you have a first album like that, you get to hear, that sets the, you get to hear what set the tone for every single thing that came after that. If mm-hmm. you don't have that, then you don't have any of the stuff that sounds like exactly. it. And that's one big problem that I have I have a lot of with younger bands I see nowadays. Maybe maybe not so much metal bands. I feel like metal bands know their roots. I'll mm-hmm. meet bands that are that are more so maybe in like metalcore world, because that's that's a part of our sound as well. And I'll reference some bands, oh you guys remind me of these bands or these bands, and they don't know where it came from. You know, if you're a metal band, you have to know what old Metallica is. You should know you better know Ride the Lightning and Master of Puppets. But if you're mm-hmm. from like the hardcore world, you should know cro and you should know Black Flag and you should know that that's kind of like the Master of Puppets world of that that built that up. And I think that's what's so great about metal fan- metal fans. We always know where the roots come from. And I think mm-hmm. that young bands need to always dig backwards and say, why was Metallica playing this? Just like you said, you know, playing the roots of New Wave of British Heavy Metal into Thrash. And I feel like, you know, when you mentioned that, it made me think that Ride the Lightning reminds me of if you took kill them all and instead of playing everything the a string like everything pretty much on kill them all is an a string a little bit higher and they just shifted it down to the e string when hmm. you think of like a lot of the riffs that are happening on kill them all it's like the riffs that happen on the first track but you don't need to down tune to get heavy exactly. you just need to play it a little bit different exactly yeah they just shifted over a string whereas mm-hmm. master of puppets i feel like you can even see the roots of where melodic death metal would later on play some of the riffs like with the inverted like minor third chords like the minor third power chords and battery I feel like those are the things you see slower played later on by bands like Early in Flames or things like maybe some Dismember or some things that were influenced by Stockholm and Tampa Death Metal. Mm-hmm. You see that in Master of Puppets, or I don't see that as much from Ride the Lightning. And I think mm-hmm. that's maybe why I like Master so much, because you see the roots of melodic death metal even in some of the rhythm guitar parts, which is cool. That is interesting. There's one thing that I kind of noticed through this is that, Joe, it's like, I think you're kind of into like the early Metallica. So like your arguments are like going towards kill them all almost like that style. And then Matt, like your arguments are like going towards what would become the black album. Like what do you guys have to say about uh, like your albums that you're arguing like versus those directions? Um, I think it's interesting that you picked up on the traces of, master of puppets that influence some stuff that may not be a direct correlation like a lot of people don't put dismember and metallica in the same breath yeah those same minor third chords that the, the dismember does are from master i mean master is like one of the first things i can think of that does those those, those inverted power chords that are shaped like this mm-hmm. i think that's what they're called minor thirds but yeah the minor third power chords and they just tune them down to like c and b and you see and them then play them through a boss hm2 play them slower. yeah exactly <laughs> And, you know, when we're talking about, like, directions of Metallica, I think that since something so new has come out, Paulo, my, Corey, and myself always talk about how much we love Load and Reload as well. As really? much as we love okay. the old stuff, those two records are amazing. And I think that anybody who was ever a naysayer of those records back then should re-listen to them now. The tones of those two records and the tone of Garage Incorporated, those are some of the best recorded metal albums ever, in addition to Black Album. I think those four all sound incredible. And the songs on Load and Reload are amazing, amazing, amazing. As much as I'm a fan of the old Metallica, I think those two records, those are old Metallica now. You know, those are what, 94? I guess you're right. That is, that is almost, yeah, those are almost 20. somewhat classic yeah. records. If I mm-hmm. guess if Nirvana is classic yeah. by now, then and so, is, so are those records. Those are definitely old Metallica records now, and they're so good. And I think that people should re-listen to those as well mm. and check them back out. Yeah, they're different. They're very different. But I think that, I don't know if they were hinting at much of, you can't. You can kind of see the traces of where load and reload would go later on from Master of Puppets, but 
in like the clean section of Master of Puppets itself. Yeah. Well, I just as far as Ride the Lightning though goes, um, one thing that I love about it is James Hetfield's vocal performance, which is interesting because he didn't even want to sing on that damn record. <laughs> he tried to bring in John Bush from Armored Saint, and he said no. So James was like, ah, well, I guess I have to do the vocals, and he he puts in a convincing performance, which is pretty funny for a guy who didn't even want to do that job. Because you've got you know Welcome Home on Master of Puppets. And like you said, that indicated where they were going to next on the Black mm -hmm. Album, which is pretty cool that, you know, you've got something like you've got Battery, which sounds like it could have been off Ride the Lightning. Mm -hmm. And then you've got stuff that's hinting at the next one. But for me, that could also be a little bit of a lack of cohesion. And for me, like when I think of Thrash 2, I usually think of down up picking, like Slayer picking. Mm -hmm, totally. Like, yeah. Which isn't something you hear as much on Master of Puppets. You do hear it a lot on Ride the Lightning, but I feel like you don't hear as much as Master of Puppets because everything's so down pick based. And... I think when I hear Master Puppets, I don't really hear a date or a time on it. Like, it feels like that could be now. And it feels like it's, it, does. It, it doesn't really have a date to it. And the recording quality, especially. Guitar tones still sound semi-modern. And as much as I love Ride Lightning, I feel like that's where it does have a time and a date. Like, when you listen to the record itself. Oh, absolutely. The recording quality does sound like 80s recording quality. Whereas Master, it could be kind of anywhere. But when they play all of them live, they, they sound perfect now, so... Just trying to argue from my, my side. <laughs> you know where that it's down not an picking, easy argument. The down picking thing came from that. That all came from old punk. That came from Johnny Ramone, because Kirk Hammett was so influenced by him in the way that Johnny would do down picking all the time. Like strictly down picking it was like a marathon of only. He refused to up pick. It was ridiculous. <laughs> so, like, and Kirk, you know, he'll tell you any day how much he loves Johnny Ramone. So that down picking style. It's weird to think that that's really something that was based in punk rock, and then you know, guys like Metallica brought I, it to I think this those new. Are the, that's when the the best forms of music come out is when it's mixed with things, when it's like intertwined. Like if you look at, mm. when you look at Gothenburg bands or melodic death metal, yeah, like Swedish folk, Tampa Stockholm death metal, and New Wave British heavy metal, and that's why it made this new thing. And it's funny that um, I, I didn't know that about the the Kirk story, but what's cool is I, we did a Guitar World interview with him years ago, in like two thousand six. And he was asking us about tremolo picking. And he thought it was interesting that we use tremolo picking as a source of like rhythm guitar playing. Yeah. Or something we got from bands like, you know, like more of an angel or like and black metal band. bands yeah, too. Exactly. And how that became like a big rhythm thing. And I remember he thought that was really interesting that we use that not just a lead thing, but as a rhythm technique. Yeah, for sure. Like we, we were talking about dissection earlier and like, well, Joe and I will talk about dissection all day. And oh, like, God. and as you were saying of those different, um, like the, the Nordic, Qualities because if you listen to dissection, you'll still hear some of like that, more like, being sweet, yeah. like the totally do 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 like you'll still hear that, like a little bit, but in like a minor yeah. key, bro. <laughs> so, <laughs> speaking of you're right, that sing like that. Have you, you remember the band Mythitin? Did you listen to Mythitin? Yeah, the uh, pre Falconer band. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't know that. Yeah, really, that's those guys. Wow, yeah, Mythitin has the very like folksy black metal sound, to yeah, it. definitely. Yeah. I think that you can't go wrong with if if you're like a Scandinavian band like give me a little like toodly do in there <laughs> just a little like a little Tolkien and, yeah oh god of course Tolkien you know but uh you know um going into to Master of Puppets and and Ride the Lightning like I think do you think Ride the Lightning is maybe the last Metallica record that is like m still has like the Mustang sort of stamp on it. Or like the Mustang feel to it a little bit. I mean, by the time they hit Master of Puppets, like the sound was so far removed. I think it was from totally Kill gone. All. Yeah, and I, there's still traces from Ride the Lightning that you can make the correlation between Kill 'Em All. But I mean, you go from first album to third album, and it's you it's see, they're pretty far apart. You can see Ride the Lightning traces on Justice. I feel though, like if you look at Dyer's Eve, the, mm. the way that riff is picked, sure. that's kind of more Ride the Lightning. Kill 'em all picking than it is Master Puppets picking. Yeah, I think so. That's a weird like jump yeah, there. That's more Ride the Lightning style riffing than Master Puppets. Yeah. Now, where do you have Injustice for All in your pecking order? Because that seems to be kind of like a little bit of a silent favorite by a lot of fans. Kind of like the yeah, it's true. The underrated Dark Horse album. Yeah, I wish I wish there was bass guitar on it. <laughs> I think everybody does. So is Jason Newstead. <laughs> um, if. And it always changes because even changes with our own band. If we're talking about today, today I would do Master Puppets, 
Black Album, Ride of Lightning, Justice, Garage Incorporated. I love that. <laughs> I love that there you go. so much. Load, reload, then probably Kill Em All for me. Wow. Yeah. So what is it about Kill Em All that just doesn't really get it done for you? I got, when I got into Metallica, so I got into them through the Black Album, and the next records I got were, I always looked for the newest things. I didn't know, I didn't, mm-hmm. I wasn't really on the internet much. I was 12 years old. Yeah. I think I got Load, Reload, and Garage Incorporated next. So maybe it's because it's some of the earlier stuff I heard. And then when I got familiar with that, I backtracked and went directly around Black Album. So I got what was immediately after and immediately before it. When I finally hit Kill 'Em All, it almost didn't even sound like the same band that I was into from Black Album, Master Puppets, Justice, Load, Reload. Yeah, it's once you're a few true, albums deep, that, that's, yeah. it's pretty alien as far yeah, as the yeah. sound goes. Yeah, it's like the blueprints of what Metallica was mm-hmm. like before they added everything on top. I mean, it's a freaking amazing record, but for me today, it'd probably be, yeah, that, that far because of what, how I got into them. I came into them, what, it would have been, what year would that be? 1998, 1999, I got into Metallica through mm-hmm. the 1991 album. Or mm-hmm. was it 1990? Black album. 91. 91. Well, yeah, 90. it's the 25th anniversary this yeah, year. So it was 98 okay. when I got into a band's 91 album. Well, yeah, I mean, that same. I mean, we're we're your age, so yeah, it's yeah. weird to think, but yeah, it's true. That's you know, we have kind of the same perspective on these records as we go back, and you know, it's not necessarily like we're looking for a zeitgeist, like not not today's zeitgeist, but like what was the spirit of the age back then, and like whatever year it happens to be. So it's like it's interesting what what time period you know everyone always says like oh i wish i was born in, in this year and in that year or whatever so yeah i think anyone that says that now about anything pre-iphone they'd be pretty miserable yeah <laughs> in the 80s with using calling cards and pay phones yeah those were in the suitcase cell phones yeah. and stuff those were weird. would you go see judas priest on the defenders of the faith tour oh god I would i'll make turn in my sacrifice. sacrifice i'll turn in my you phone you can't snapchat it though so no, oh, I, don't you're there. I don't care. That's fine. I don't care about anyone <laughs> that's else. For the generation after ours, that um, is. Yeah, I think our third drummer wasn't even born, in, or was born when the Black Album came out, which is crazy to think. Which makes me that's feel so, really so, old. So he was a '90s kid. <laughs> yeah, how weird. It's yeah. like being 30 and feeling really old. Yeah, my body feels old. Sure. <laughs> yeah. Uh, all right, well, that's Rocker versus Writer, everybody. Let us <laughs> know. <laughs> Let us know what your favorite Metallica album is in the comment section below if you are listening on YouTube. The comment uh, section are probably really mad at me for saying that Kill 'em All is below Load and Reload right well, now. Well, they're going to just be mad by you just talking about Load or Reload, yeah, but at no. least you didn't talk Lulu. So, oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I do challenge everyone to, to give Load and Reload another chance. If, yeah, but I mean, we talk about it like it's a badly selling record. Each one probably did like what ten, twelve million a piece. I mean, yeah, they didn't <laughs> sell bad at all. I mean, that that wasn't the issue. I don't yeah. think. But I mean, St. Records... Anger didn't sell that bad, really. Yeah, that one. Mm. Another issue too is when it came out. It's the mid '90s. Like bands trying to do like a little bit more of a groove or grunge sound. There's better bands for that. So it's when you have all those new exciting bands coming out, more of a legacy band releasing something like that. That's kind of trying to. I don't want to say like pander, but keep up with the trends because everybody does want to. I feel like that was legitimately though where some of them were at though, you know, with with Hetfield seeming to like a lot of like country vibe things. Mm -hmm. And I think that like Unforgiven 2 is great. I think Until It Sleeps is awesome. Those tones are really good. I think you guys need to go listen to those two records Mm. tonight when we're done with this Mm. and be like, just just give it a shot. Give it like a, don't go into a preconceived thought. Don't be like, this should be Ride Lighting. Just check it out for the music. And I think it's I think it's really good. Even when they play those those they don't play as many of them live. When they play a couple of those songs live in the European festivals, people are freaking out. And there was actually a fan voted thing where they actually played Saint Anger live. I I saw that. Yeah. <laughs> we were at that show. You were? We were in the snake pit watching. Really? Yeah. I remember James was on stage. He's like, Well, I mean, you that guys was, you guys we went for it, so <laughs> you we're we are not to blame for and this. The Germans not... were freaking out over that song. Everyone yeah. in the crowd was singing Saint Anger. <laughs> Well, I mean, even if you hate that song, you probably know the words to it. And you know what? In a live setting, a bad song can Stuff sound is a amazing. a lot different live. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm not saying go home and check that one. I'm saying go <laughs> load and reload. Just, just clear in the air on that one. The redeeming quality. <laughs> Garage Incorporated too, man. Astronomy is such an amazing cover. Mm. And I, I heard, you know, even your shirt, I heard The Misfits for the first time through Metallica. Yeah. Which probably everyone in our age did. Probably, um... 
from maybe like, them like doing Last Dynamite Caress. Darling, Last Caress, Green yeah. Hill. Mm. Yeah. yeah, that was some good stuff. I, I do like Actually, I that. probably heard that before I heard any yep. Misfits. I definitely AOL did. AOL Radio. Yep. <laughs> I, I would have heard Metallica's covers first and then Famous Monsters and then Backtracked. Oh, wow. So you went... To- Wow, went to Famous Monsters. Again, you're our age. Yep. So, yeah, you go to Famous Monsters because yep. it's like, you know, that's, I don't know, maybe their best-selling one, maybe. I don't know. Probably, yeah. And it's got all the all the songs that are named after monsters, so yeah. check it out. Why not? Yep. But, yeah. Uh, you were saying that you, like, you you know, you're, you're 30, am mm-hmm. I right? Yeah, so saying that you're feeling old, and it is like a bizarre but very realistic concept of yeah. you know being on tour for such a long yeah, time I, I burn the candle at all ends i mean it's from from the years of touring i i do a lot of brazilian jiu-jitsu yeah so my ankles popped currently yeah it hurts i i did a little bit of mma and just absolutely left in just the worst like like <laughs> like i could choke someone now but also my arm was like out of its socket so like, <laughs> yeah, you like, learn the components separately I think yeah. like, learn the grappling learn the striking then piece it together <laughs> yeah it's difficult but uh you know when it comes to burning the candle at both ends, you know, is it somewhat of a frightening prospect at times to think, oh, wow, you know, I hope I don't burn out at age 30? No, because the only time I would have would have been around 18, 19, 20. And I remember playing our first giant festival show. It's it's still hailed by all the magazines in the UK as like one of the best performances of download ever was Trivium in 2005 playing download. Okay. I remember that day, the two days leading up to it, we were partying the whole time up to it. I hardly mm. slept for the show. My nose was still bloody, if that gives away anything. Uh-huh. My voice sounded like absolute horse shit. I wasn't warmed up. We looked like shit. We had a little postage stamp size backdrop that was up. <laughs> 11 o'clock, we walk on stage, there's nobody there. And 11.01, or maybe it was 10.59, no, it was there. 11 o'clock, 40,000 people come running up and watch the set. For some reason, the Damn. set went really, really well. And it's the one that's on the OzFest DVD. That, okay. that download performance and um after that show it went well and i was like i have no idea why this went well and i said i can never do this to myself again i was like i need to be <laughs> on it for our fans mm. all the time so <laughs> thankfully it was like on the verge of kind of, and we've had moments where like the band's almost broken up we've gotten in fights and and things weren't going well and chemistry was bad and we've had all sorts of moments like that it's, it goes up and down like any other job it's of not like a miracle job but I do see a lot of band guys bitching. We do have it a lot easier than most other people. We get to play music for a living, which is awesome. Yeah. Um. So we've had ups and downs, but no, there, there's no way I would I would burn out physically or my voice or guitar playing or live. That would never happen now. I do too much to make sure it's good. Now, do you think that performance went so well because everybody acknowledged like, hey, we're spent. Like, if we're going to do this, like, we need to suck it up and like try to give a high energy show. And it just wound up being like maybe, maybe. even more energy than you. Maybe that was in the back of our minds from all the, you know, the childhood of always wanting to do this and then doing it right. But yeah, that was, that was, we were lucky on that one because I've seen some other footage from that tour like a week before that where we were dog shit live, Uh absolutely horrible. (laughs) And we're we're never content with ever letting that happen. Well, it's weird. Sometimes you capture a moment in those, those, those times, like in a bad time where you're just like, you feel like garbage and, Mm -hmm. and. You, you capture something that's just so raw and primal and real that it just kind of hits people in this weird way. Like what came to my mind is like the Allison Chains Unplugged because Lane Staley was totally, you know, dope sick. Uh, uh, Jerry, Jerry was Cantrell, sick too, right? he was sick. He had food poisoning because he ate like a bad hot dog or something. On that record? Yeah. Wow. And you could never tell, but like. You could hear like sort of this dark, like bleak mm-hmm. misery in there. Well, that was the version I was learning. I just covered down in a hole, like right before oh, coming in here. That that hard acoustic drive. rendition that of like, that, that song. That was the version I was learning off, and I was like, huh, it because is I noticed amazing. a couple of words they switched to. And it, it what's really cool about hearing that record now, because I've I've only heard that unplugged record now for the first time. Okay. Because yeah, I I I was into them, but I wasn't like a super fan of Alice in Chains because I got sure. into metal when I could have been getting into rock. Yeah. And so I just checked out that version and I was like, wow, it's really weird hearing a live record that hasn't been overly corrected and perfected because that's mm-hmm. what every band does now. Mm-hmm. Like I see van bands with Pro Tools rigs live and when a live record comes out, it's not really live because they patched everything in the studio, but that you can hear that it's live. You can hear like a finger not quite fretting the, the fret mm-hmm. properly and that sounds amazing Yeah, to hear that human natural The human tone. element, mm-hmm. of course. Yeah, so that was for me because I was analyzing the song for the cover. Because I knew the original, but I wanted to hear how they did it acoustically. I was like, man, this is so cool to hear imperfection, to hear human beings singing and maybe a harmony not being perfect, and to hear the the struggle towards a note. 
And that's something that I miss so much from music. Yeah. That's something that's so yeah, great to see when a band like Metallica plays live, Iron Maiden plays, plays live, a lot of great bands play live. There's no tracks. There's no backup musicians. Mm-hmm. It's actually the band that you're paying to see. Mm-hmm. It's not part of the CD, which is, which is really refreshing. Yeah. And we saw Iron Maiden um, that show up in Boston on the Seven Sun tour. And when they played Wasted Years, they just like could not really get in sync with each other. And yeah, it's it was funny. Weird. Just, and it's to see a band like Iron Maiden like display those human qualities because yep. like you know they put on a top notch live yep. show and it's like oh wow like they do have an off night or just yeah. they do have a moment where not everything is going perfectly like mm-hmm. that. Yeah, I'll, I fuck up live all the time, and if it's really bad, I'll laugh about it. I'll call myself <laughs> out. I'll talk about it. It's like that's you got that's it. part of beings. it though. Yeah. yeah, even with this acoustic thing, it's it's on our Facebook now from the Facebook Live over there. I started up uh, until the world goes cold. And I fucked up and I was like, oh, I fucked up and starting over. <laughs> <laughs> now, um, you were mentioned dissection before. Uh, you're a huge black metal fan. Yep. Yep. <laughs> Mind, Mind Scar, Scar t-shirt. Shirt. And you've had this project in Ritu. Mm-hmm. Did I pronounce that right? Yep. Ritu. All right. Um, and Isan is going to be collaborating with you. He's one of my favorite musicians. Absolutely brilliant composer, self-producer, everything. Um, last update we had was that you guys had kind of fleshed out a couple songs, bounced ideas back and forth. Um, what's the status on that? We just both have to find time, you know, between Emperor Reunions and Ishan Records. Yeah, he just booked out 2017 he, a little bit. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> boy. Constant trivium stuff. Once our schedules align, we're going to do it. Because he's co-written several of the songs. He's mm-hmm. produced. He's going to produce the record. There's a bunch of songs written. They're in demo stages. And he's been able to produce like three or four of them and rewrite a couple of them and co-write a couple of them. It's incredible. It originally was going to be, my original plan was to make old school traditional black metal under mm-hmm. a nickname, so no one, so people could listen to it without a bias. I'm not saying, oh, this is the guy from Trivium. What does he know about black metal? Mm-hmm. Or actually, I know a lot about black metal. <laughs> but I happen to be in a band that's not a black metal band. Um, so I was going to do it like that. I showed him some of those early demos, and he's like, "This sounds like great traditional black metal." And that was really it. And I started listening to Aramita and what he was doing with his solo stuff, and then started getting into. More so what's going on with black metal now. Bands like Alcest, to one end of it, being very mm-hmm. melodic and the no shoegaze, screaming and yeah. singing and beautiful moments. Or Death Spell Omega, which I think is has influenced every black metal band a little yeah, bit. Yeah, they're probably the leading one of the yeah. new millennium. And what Behemoth is doing now with the Satanist, I think the Satanist is one of the greatest records ever. So I was listening to what everyone's doing. Yeah, we doing. agree on that one. <laughs> Absolutely. Yes. We will say that's probably like the best album of the 2010s. Yeah. Uh, one of the like, best black metal albums ever. So, ever, ever. Oh, the lyrics, actually, so evil. Mm-hmm. And actually, Soski Occultus was a huge influence on the Crusade, which is something nobody knows. Our record Crusade. Yeah, right? yeah. Because if you like, look at the riff from Ignition, that's very much so influenced by the riffs that they were doing on that record, except they were tuned down to like B. Okay. They were like, oh, let's tune to standard thrash stuff, put in thrash influences, but also some of this behemoth stuff and those mm-hmm. screaming. Oh, God. So, back, back where, where was I? Oh, yeah. So I got an Aramita and started seeing what Black Metal was, and, and I realized that. If black metal is the rebellion to what everyone else was doing in metal, what was, if that's what black metal is, the rebellion to what everyone else is doing, and when black metal becomes the same thing and rooted in the same traditions, then it becomes kind of the idea of what black metal is rebelling against in the first place. So I think Counterintuitive. Yeah, so it's even more black metal to all of a sudden do something that's so un-black metal, like saxophone solos and jazz chords and clean singing. Mm-hmm. Like knock and and moments and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. Lugubrum. Yeah, and so I started, I got rid of all the ideas for that and started writing that with, with that in mind. This doesn't have to be one thing. This could be the idea, the mentality of black metal, but it doesn't matter what it comes out like. So I, I, it's hard to describe music in, in terms of words, but it's... So what three bands would you compare the sound of the Maritzu stuff? <sighs> That's a good question. There are moments that Ishan was like, this reminds me of... What, what did we say? What did we both say? It, or some moments remind him of Ennio Morricone, the spaghetti western composer. Really? Hmm. But it doesn't sound like spaghetti western in, in like the way that I was treating the instruments. So it's it's weird. Huh. I, I don't know. I'm almost not surprised that that would come from him, though. Yeah. Because yeah. He, he, is a, he is a very wide array of... Yeah. Uh, he works exclusively out of his comfort zone. Yeah. yeah. And we did talk about different instruments. He was talking about like utilizing like accordion and just different, wow. yeah. different ideas. He makes it work. <laughs> He's great. Yeah. Well, he, had the, um, he played on the Heidevolk stuff, too. What's that? Um, I think it was Heide Folk. Um, there's some like Norwegian, oh, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Yep. Norwegian um, folk musician that mm-hmm. he collaborated with. I think that was the name of it. 
But those were. I hope I'm right on that. I, could be wrong. Let's not make those the selling points of what the band sounds like, because those ideas have morphed since then. I just need to make mm-hmm. the record and let everybody hear. It. <laughs> yeah, <that's, laughs> I think. Uh, yeah, I think you've confused everybody now yeah, more than ever. So, good. which is good, because now good. it clouds everything yep. and builds anticipation. Yeah. It was going to be black metal, and now it's shifted into something with the mentality of black metal, mm-hmm. but not the old school idea of black metal, the new school idea mm. of black metal. And <laughs> it's cool because there's a lot of similarities between Silence in the Snow and Isan's new album Arctis. Because um, and you was, both contributed to each other's albums yeah. as well, yeah. And because um, Isan said that he was intentionally going for a little bit of more of a formulaic pop structure with these huge hooks and things that he had never really tried before. I mean, obviously, you know, Emperor has all these cool hooks, but nothing mm-hmm. in this sort of capacity. Yeah. And there's a lot of just so many like huge sweeping lush mm-hmm. moments on Silence in the Snow. So it seems like right now you guys are at a pretty equal <laughs> headspace. Awesome. Hmm. Yeah, he's become a huge mentor to me. Um, a friend, an equal, you know, I'm still a massive fan of everything he does, but it's cool that he's become a teacher to me for Mm -hmm. all things music. Um, One of the most interesting words I used to describe the new Ishan, which I couldn't believe that I used it, was fun. Like some of the riffs were like, Mm. man, it feels like I'm listening to like 80s metal, but him playing it, which I Mm -hmm. really liked a lot. It felt so different. Um, And I think that that's the ultimate form of creativity to destroy the idea or go completely against the idea you did before mm-hmm. which is what that's how black metals influenced trivium and i know it sounds insane to say that the crusade is somehow influenced by black metal but it is in the way that emperor every record you never know what you're getting into it could be the polar opposite of the previous that's what i wanted to do mm-hmm. from ascendancy of the crusade make something the polar opposite it had none of the ingredients i didn't want a single breakdown or any screaming or anything that was an ingredient on this i want to i don't want on this one hmm. yeah that's interesting yeah. Um, cause I read something where you were talking about the ascendancy and you said that you were, um, you were trying to cater to people who didn't like Trivium yet. That was like, okay, you didn't like this last album. So I think you know what? I might've been saying the crusade or yeah, that crusade. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Um, you were saying that, you know, okay, you guys didn't like that album. That's fine. I'm going to give you something you will like. Mm-hmm. And you switch the style. Yep. And we, um, the UK and the U S both seem to love ascendancy and not love the crusade but the crusade it was where mainly europe started liking our band mm-hmm. and like other countries it was really it's still interesting every mm-hmm. record release has different fans in different countries that seem to gravitate towards it now what's it like trying to put together a set list because there's so many of these different <laughs> sounds and like do you have different tours in mind where like you know we're going to lean heavily maybe on this style material and then we're going to do another one where it's just going to be our heaviest stuff we have Anything we, like that? There was a year where we did four polar opposite support tours in North America. We supported Dream Theater, Five Finger Death Punch, In Flames, and Asking Alexandria. Four That's of the most different. different tours you could possibly <laughs> do in the same territory. Very true. And we could have catered every single set to every single tour. You know, more breakdowns for the Asking Alexandria tour, um, more progressive long stuff for the Dream Theater tour, more singy stuff for the Five Finger tour, maybe older stuff for the In Flames mm-hmm. tour. But we didn't. We played exactly what we felt like playing for all four it was like almost the same set which is a couple things mixed in but we played the more progressive stuff for the people that should have gotten simpler stuff the simpler stuff for the people should have gotten more progressive for some reason we like to just do the opposite (laughs) of what someone would tell us to do or what Mm -hmm. we think we should do which feeds into that black metal mindset too maybe Uh, just being dickheads (laughs) (laughs) well unfortunately we're running out of time but we want to thank you so much matt for stopping by we appreciate it so much awesome chat Oh, thank you. Thank you. We, we had a great time, too. Uh, Silence in the Snow, the newest Trivium record. And, of course, look forward to what this man is going to give you in the future. Matt Heafy, everybody. Thank you. Hey, talk and dissection with Matt Heafy. Yeah, that's, awesome. one of my, <laughs> that's one of my favorite albums ever. Yeah, Storm of the Lights. Should be everybody's. Yeah, another another favorite of that. I just got that on picture disc. Evil, evil picture disc. Uh, so we want to thank Matt Hafey for coming in. Awesome to hear that he's been doing great with his harsh vocals and that he's been, like, bettering his voice. And, you know, maybe we'll uh, hear some harsh vocals on a new Trivium album soon. Yeah, I could imagine if you're struggling with your voice like that and having it hurt so much, it would probably kind of deter you from wanting to write heavier vocal parts and everything like that yeah it's, it sounded awful just going through that just a singer your livelihoods are going to be taken away if you can't sing so yeah. it's great to hear that he's been doing well uh load and reload really an advocate of those records 
I mean, it's interesting. Like we brought this up too with the Zach Wild podcast. Like you know, Zach was growing up as these albums were coming out, and we talked about how we've just looked back on these collectively, and that's what he was doing too. He wasn't getting load and reload when they were new. Yeah. So we didn't have that perspective of maybe being let down. That's true. When it came out, there's the anticipation building. It was like four or five years between the, those albums and the Black albums. So people were ready, and then it's like they got that. Maybe just wasn't what they expected. But when you look back on it, it could sound fresh and. Who cares what year it was released in? Yeah, so, I mean, we have the same perspective as him. You know, he's basically like, you know, when we were freshmen in high school, he was a senior. So it's like, (laughs) it's weird to think. He's our youngest uh, guest so far, actually, by Mm. a fair margin. And at 20 years old, opening for Iron Maiden. And he's still super ambitious about everything, which was a, a really cool characteristic to demonstrate because, I don't know, if I was 20 years old and I was in a band and I just toured with Iron Maiden, I'd be like, yeah, that's probably as good as it's going to get, and I'd be totally content with that. Yeah, you've hit, you've hit your peak, not. and death is all that's there to look forward to. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, you got the feeling that he's still really hungry and that there's more to accomplish. And to, to hear that from not only a veteran, but a guy who is still very young and can still do a lot is awesome. And that's the Loudwire podcast. Thank you so much for tuning in. Remember, hit that subscribe button, hit it it. on YouTube, and also subscribe to us on iTunes, hit that subscribe button too. Back on YouTube, hit that like button, leave us some nice comments, share with your friends. They definitely want to hear it. I don't know your friends, I just know that they want to hear our podcast. They do. And, of course, follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, go to loudwire.com for all your daily rock and metal news, follow me at Graham Wire on Twitter. Thank you so much. We'll see you next time.